Well, good morning. Welcome to the Nebraska Innovation Campus on the amazing campus of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. My name is Mike Baim. I have the privilege of serving as the um, NU, University of Nebraska Vice President for Agriculture and Natural Resources, and as the IENR Institute of Ag and Natural Resources Harlan Vice Chancellor. And I welcome you, those of you who are here with us, socially distanced and masks on, to, uh, as well as those that are live streaming, uh, connected via live streaming from across the country and certainly uh, in Nebraska. We have a distinguished uh, panel of uh, experts, friends, leaders, first and foremost, and we get a chance to, to hear from them and for you ultimately to ask some questions. We're on a very tight time schedule. Uh, we will start now and we will end promptly at 11 o'clock and then um, at that point if you're here and not part of the official uh, panel or a member of the media, we ask that you uh, find your way um, down to the mill, grab some coffee on your way out such that they could have some quiet as they do their media interviews. Um, without further ado, I have the privilege of introducing our president, uh, uh, Ted Carter. I will just say a few things about Ted. I'm a retired Navy officer. Ted's a retired Navy officer, although he outranks me by about seven, seven uh, rank. Uh, honor, courage, and commitment. The three core values of the United States Navy. And for 38 years, Ted Carter wore the fabric of our, our great country, defending our freedom, our freedom to assemble, our freedom to innovate, and our freedom to work collaboratively to keep and move this country forward as a world leader. So without further ado, President Carter will introduce our distinguished guests. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mike, and good morning, everyone. And uh, what a privilege it is to be with you here in person at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln Innovation Campus. I am Ted Carter. I'm the eighth president of the University of Nebraska, and I've been the president here since 1 January. So I'm, I'm working into my nine month, and I am truly a Nebraskan. I can uh, honestly say that. And uh, my job here is very simple and pretty short, is to give a, a quick introduction to our panel. Uh, and then get into the heart of what's happening at this most critical time in our nation as we here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and across our multiple campuses, four campuses across the state, 51,000 students attending class in person at this very moment, being led by 16,000 faculty and staff, and we're incredibly proud of that and to be part of that here at the Lincoln campus. First and foremost, our governor for the state of Nebraska, Governor Pete Ricketts, in his second term, uh, I can honestly say, uh, having a chance to get to meet all 49 senators of our unique unicameral here in the state of Nebraska. Governor Pete Ricketts is a true friend of the university. Uh, he actually was our keynote speaker for my investiture just two weeks ago, and I'm thankful for his friendship, his leadership, and what he's done for the state of Nebraska. Secretary of Agriculture, Agriculture Sonny Perdue. So uh, Secretary, as uh, many of you know, has a, a lifetime of leadership in the agricultural business, having grown up in Georgia, having gone to University of Georgia, where he studied vet veterinary science. Uh, he went on to become the, uh, the governor of Georgia. And in full disclosure, we met while he was a governor of Georgia, and I was the captain on the USS Carl Vinson, where I created a relationship with the uh, University of Georgia's Carl Vinson Institute of Government. So, uh, Mr. Secretary, it's great to see you. Welcome back to Nebraska. I know everybody's excited to see you here back with us. Congressman Jeff Fortenberry has been representing the first district for the state of Nebraska since 2005, member of the House Appropriations Committee. And I can honestly say, having gotten to know Congressman Fortenberry, that he is a true advocate for everything that we do, especially on the national defense side for the University of Nebraska. So Congressman, good to see you as well. And of course, uh, Chancellor Ronnie Green. Dr. Ronnie Green, uh, been the chancellor here at UNL since 2016. And if you are having a boring day, just think about how busy Ronnie Green is these days dealing with the Big Ten and college football. And uh, I just want to say that uh, for all the things that you're reading out there, just know that there's no Council of Presidents and Chancellors meetings today because Ronnie's here. So in the information and disinformation campaign, 
uh, what's going to be happening in college football, I will tell you right now, is being led by the conversations that are coming out of here in the state of Nebraska. But beyond Husker football and other athletics, Ronnie is a remarkable talent in the academic field, in veterinary medicine, a remarkable uh, career getting to this path, and I couldn't be more proud of the work he's doing here as chancellor. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our panel. And Mike, back over to you. Thanks, Ted. We'll jump right into it. I'd be remiss, however, if I didn't say thank you to those assembled here, those on, uh, watching via live stream, our producers, our processors, our farmers, our ranchers, uh, are really amazing innovators in this, uh, in this state. It's a hallmark of who they are, hard work, the grit, the determination, and it is just personal pleasure and fun and humble to be a part of innovating and co-creating uh, ag innovation solutions for the future. So shout out to all of you here and, uh, and, uh, and listening via live stream. Well, this is a, a question to get us going. We just finished a tour, albeit a quick tour. And I wondered if you could uh, think a little bit about what, what you just saw, what you heard from some of our amazing faculty, and share some of your impressions about the tours, the takeaways, and about agricultural innovation in general, just to set the stage. And we'll, we'll start with... Uh, with the secretary, Mr. Secretary. I would love to start there, uh, Mike, because it was uh, obviously very intriguing of what we saw. This uh, January, we began with our Ag Innovation Agenda, and, and what we see it here is just uh, playing out there with all the innovative things that you had from the uh, high-pressure pasteurization to help preserve food more, but certainly in the genomic and, and phenome type of analysis of plants, how they adapt to climate change, and how they can be more productive. Uh, we all want to be sustainable in agriculture, and that's what I saw here. The kind of basic and applied research provides a path forward to sustainability while we have the obligation to feed the growing world of 10 billion people. And USDA's motto is now is do right and feed everyone, but it really is universities like this that, uh, that make that happen. I, I think, uh, Governor, you can tell from uh, uh, the the president's remarks, Big Red's chosen well for another leader, and uh, we're happy to be here. Obviously, we, uh, we very much appreciate you all loaning Greg Iba to <laughs> us as well and uh, doing a great job at his position and, uh, at USDA. And, uh, but the things that we see happening here from food processing, food safety, the most intriguing thing and where I think the future of uh, food and agriculture is, is really, uh, really food for medicine. And uh, we were talking about coming out, walking out of the, all the, the things that we're working on, how food can actually be therapeutic for our bodies, matching those kind of things with what our bodies really need and prosper with. For the, that's, that's the do right part while we feed everyone. It's really uh, creating a healthy generation uh, going forward. So uh, it depends on basic science like we see here, this ag innovation and then moving into applied research like we saw in the drones uh, in the fields there, and then finally through a great extension service, moving into the application from regular producers, be they animal or, <laughs> or plant-based uh, uh, plant producers. So it's, it's thrilling to me to, to see the, the nexus of the ag innovation at university come together with new and, and, and creative things, designing things that we don't even know about yet that will help us fulfill that in the biotech sector as well as all other other ways of, of processing and handling, making food more safe and more healthy, more nutritious. So I'm happy to be here. I look forward to learning more about it. Yeah, that's, that's great. So uh, stimulating <laughs> ag innovation to increase food production by 40% while cutting our footprint by by, by half by the That's year 2050. Right. Yeah, the Ag Innovation Agenda, thank you. And it won't happen without the th type of things that we saw here this morning happening all over the country. Yeah. Well, Governor Ricketts, do uh, you mind following the Secretary there? Well, the Secretary is always a tough act to follow. Uh -huh. So, uh, but uh, thank you again, Secretary, for being here. We really appreciate it. Yeah, the things we saw here today, I think, were <clears throat> just really cool, the technology. You mentioned the the high pressure pasteurization, which doesn't involve heat and therefore preserves the food better and you know, so it tastes better. That's real world stuff. We just saw that, as we were mentioning, out at PetSource, 
Uh, they're going to be doing that as far as their pet food products in Seward, Nebraska, that actually will be pasteurized here in Lincoln, which is done by a company that is uh, one of the largest in the world doing it, or one of the largest in the nation. So it's really cool to see that the things you're doing here have real world applications today. And then the follow on to that was the future stuff that you're working on that just goes in line with everything that we do here in Nebraska. You know, I'm fond of saying that our farmers and ranchers were the original conservationists. And one of the things that we have done over the years is we learned how to produce more with less. Using less water on our fields, getting higher yields uh, from our corn, for example. Those are all examples of getting to your mission of how we feed the world and do right by making sure we're preserving the environment. And the work here is really laying the groundwork for that next generation or that next step that we're going to take here in Nebraska to be able to figure out what do we do to be able to feed this growing world and do it in a way that is going to conserve our, our natural resources to be able to accomplish that. So it's, it's really in line with everything that we've done here as a state for generations with our farmers and ranchers. And the University of Nebraska is, again, with that land grant legacy, is taking it to the next level again to make sure we continue to do that here in the state. Great, thanks. And of course, uh, during President Carter's investiture, you talked about his Top Gun experience and how he was a Top Gun leader at a Top Gun university. And he reciprocated by saying, we're in a Top Gun state, certainly for ag innovation. That partnership is really, is really amazing. Congressman Fortenberry. Thanks, Mike, so much. And welcome, Mr. Secretary, again as well. We're, we're really privileged to have you here. In Congress, I am what's called a ranking member of the Agricultural Subcommittee on Appropriations. It's a lot of words, but basically we fund the budget for our farmers and ranchers, the stabilization policies, and food security throughout the country. Uh, the Secretary works intimately with us. We are on the phone <coughs> frequently uh, with the Chairman, who is a Democrat colleague of the Secretary when he was Governor, uh, and from Georgia. Because agriculture is one of these spaces that just transcends divides. It is about food, food security, health, well-being, nutrition, a lot of the things that we take for granted. So, Mike, kind of to the heart of your question, I like to, before I project out of where we're going in terms of innovation, take a step back and look at where we're coming from. If you think about America, we just have this tremendous gift of, of resources. Add in the stewardship, innovation, hard work of farmers and ranchers combined with the land-grant system 150 plus years ago now, which moved technology out in the field. This is why we lead, feed ourselves <coughs> and help feed the world and lead the entire world in this space of innovation. So just to your point of seeing some of the specifics of what you're doing uh, with plants, individual corn plants moving down a conveyor belt, being taken, having photos taken of them all along the way, water, light adjustments being made, then moving those out into the field, all oriented toward what is this 21st century architecture of what agriculture is going to be. Again, following up on the great tradition of stewardship of the land, decreasing inputs, expanding outputs, preserving that precious gift of resources. And that just doesn't happen because of abstract ideas. It happens because of collaboration and partnership with the administration, with Congress, <coughs> and with innovation happening right here. So very impressive. Thanks so much. We've yeah. got a tremendous amount of work to do, but people are all focused all around the world in many ways just right here, not only on our entire land grant system, but here at the University of Nebraska, awaiting the results of your good experimentation. Well, I, I, 21st century architecture of what agriculture is to be for society. I appreciate that. Thank you, Congressman. He stayed up all night thinking of that one. No, you know, it's, a, <laughs> it's an amazing opportunity to bring together a federal executive branch with federal um, legislative branch with state executive branch and then think about the land-grant university system. So we oftentimes talk about 1862 here. 1862 was a marquee year, the year that Morrill Act was signed into law, creating the land-grant university system of which the University of Nebraska is, a, is a, a key part of that. The U.S. Department of Agriculture was created in 1862. The Railway Act, the Pacific Railroads Act of 1862 opened up the, the transcontinental rail system that is so, so critical today in our global food system. And so with that, I'd like to uh, ask... Actually, can I just build on something that Congressman Flintbury sure. said? Because I thought uh, he hit upon something that um, I want to reiterate because it is pretty cool. 
you were talking about the corn, right? And the, it was in the greenhouse and it was getting the pictures taken. But also we saw how, we saw the video of how that was actually being taken to the field. You mentioned that. Where you actually had the corn out there and you had the spider cam that was continue, able to continue to take the pictures except, the, you know, it was out in the field, the corn doing it. That's huge that they're thinking about not only what works in the lab, but then, the, and this is what your uh, PhDs told us, it has to work in the field, yeah. right? It's not good enough just to have something academically theoretical and maybe I can duplicate it in a lab, but then it's actually got to apply itself out into the field. And again, I, I just wanted to mention that because I thought that was great that they were thinking about how to take it that next step and you know, really making that happen in a way that you could actually see in a real world way. Well, Governor Ricketts, that was a perfect setup for Chancellor Green, who will talk about translation from theory into practice. And uh, Ronnie, would you like to share your opening thoughts? Well, sure. Um, it's kind of dangerous to give me a mic on this. I think everybody in the state knows this. So it's uh, great to be here and to have a chance to talk about agriculture innovation. And welcome, Secretary Purdue, uh, back to Nebraska. I know that you were planning to be here for the State Fair last right. year about this time. Right. So you're in the old State <laughs> Fairgrounds, as we were talking about earlier. Um, here, um, this used to be the upper deck of our show floor mm. uh, in the 4-H arena. So welcome to Nebraska. Uh, you know, the, the agriculture innovation agenda that USDA has underway and the Secretary referred to uh, as having been put in place earlier this year could not be more targeted more correctly. I think that is exactly where we need to be focusing our resources. Uh, as several of the speakers have already said, the need for us to continue to increase productivity out to 2050, but doing so in a way that we know will be sustainable and will conserve those resources long term. I just wanted to congratulate the Secretary uh, here personally on that agenda because it's rooted in, and I know it's part of the plank that you have on the National uh, Academies of Science, Engineering, and mm -hmm. Medicine science breakthroughs to 2030 right. uh, that we were part of uh, framing early on uh, that points to the needs in these areas of genome to phenome and microbiome and data sciences and transdisciplinary efforts across the board. Uh, what makes me excited, Mike, to answer your question directly is that is exactly what you saw. Right. Here is that we are focused in those ways that are going to make a difference in our research programs here that will bring science to practice. So, mm -hmm. Uh, great to have you here. Always good to see the governor and the congressman, and uh, looking forward to a robust discussion. Thanks, thanks, Ronnie. Bringing science into practice. Uh, I think what I'd like to do is uh, ask each of you a, a question, and then we'll come back maybe to a group question, and then open it up to uh, folks here. Uh, Secretary Purdue, uh, one of the the wonderful things that has happened under your leadership is that you've made a concerted effort to bring the U.S. Department of Agriculture to the people of this this great country. Um, closer to the people and the producers. Would you mind pr uh, providing us, maybe the group would appreciate hearing a bit more about the thumbnail sketch on the USDA's agriculture innovation agenda um, that definitely focuses on ag innovation, but also rural prosperity, and wondered if you wouldn't mind giving us a little bit more detail. We talked about a 40% increase in food over the next 30 years while also reducing our environmental footprint. But uh, there are some other pillars of the innovation agenda that I think folks would like to hear about. Well, absolutely. Ag innovation really goes hand in hand with rural prosperity, as you well know. Uh, I would mention we use the word sustainability a lot uh, in, uh, in agriculture today. And uh, I want to kind of tell you, Chancellor, how we define it. I know you know, but I'd love for the audience to hear. Uh, really, there are three pillars of sustainability. Uh, many times, the the majority of the public think about environmental sustainability, and, and we do as well. Uh, I don't know of a farmer governor who wants to poison the land they want the future generations to utilize to grow food. So as you said, they're the original conservationists. How do we give them the tools from land-grant universities to be even better doing more with less? So there's an environmental sustainability portion of that. But when you think about doing right and feeding everyone, there is a social sustainability there. Food has to be affordable. We can't, this is not just for the elite. When you feed 10 billion people, it has to be socially affordable there, which is socially a sustainability in the ability to 
cure hunger around the world. And frankly, we've made a lot of progress in that, but there's a lot of progress that can be made in other, words, in other parts of the world that are uh, food insecure in many ways. But then the third part that many people don't think about where I appreciated uh, uh, the tool we already had this morning is a recognition from our land grants and our basic PhD scientists, there has to be economic sustainability because if farmers and producers cannot make a living doing what they're doing with all these noble causes, they can't continue. They have children to educate and families to feed and to do things as well. So there are really three pillars of that sustainability. That's why, Mike, that integration between our ag innovation agenda with really essentially doing more with less, and Chancellor, I know you're, uh, I'd love to hear about your uh, Big Ten efforts here, but uh, as, an old, as an old jock, we're keeping a scoreboard on it. Uh, Governor, Governor probably knows, and Congressman certainly knows, many times we have aspirational goals that we'll put out 10 years, Congressman, but we don't start the scoreboard until the ninth, you know, until the two minutes left on the clock. And so we're starting it now. We want to scoreboard, you know, moment by moment to see how we're doing in these goals of reducing our footprint by 50% moving forward to that. So we just don't get to the end and say, oh, uh, we didn't make it that kind of thing. So we're holding ourselves accountable to do the kind of things that will matter. And what we see here, really food for health and uh, innovation of more productivity using less resources is all part of that sustainability. So that's the, that's the great thing about our ag innovation agenda. It just slides right in like a hand in glove with our, uh, our research institutions and ag uh, land grant con uh, universities uh, like this one here. Yeah, I'm, uh, Ronnie would be happy to talk about um, uh, athletics if we're talking about turf or we're talking about high performance <laughs> athletes and their physiology and brain chemistry. But um, outside of that, I think we should keep moving along. Um, secretary. <laughs> Mr. Secretary, you're, um, you, you mentioned uh, the sustainable piece, but there's also this alignment piece. So um, part of the egg innovation agenda is the alignment of resources could you just speak a little bit from your perspective about the alignment of resources in partnership with the legislative uh, branch, with state government, uh, Secretary uh, Director Steve Wellman from Nebraska Department of Ag is in the audience, um, and our land grant system. How do, we, how, how do you see and, and where do you see us going at maximizing that integration uh, to, to meet these goals of aligning and modernizing and stimulating ag innovation? Well, obviously, we're dependent on Congressman Fortenberry and his position there to prove to them that we're being good stewards of the, of the money, the taxpayer money they appropriate to us in order that they will do more and, and that we can do more along with that. But we can't do that by ourselves, and that's the whole purpose. Uh, there, there's a great ecosystem of innovation across this country, uh, many, much of it with our Ag Research Service in the USDA in alignment with the uh, our, our land grant universities, both our 1860s and 1890s, uh, and, and those arrangements that way. You know, NIFA uh, is, the, uh, is a big partner with our land grants in the, both competitive grants as well as uh, uh, capacity grants in doing that. But there's a huge private sector. The governor's talked yep. about that, and we can't ignore that. It's really moving in a, in a, a aligned position here. And, uh, the great uh, economy of this country has allowed for innovation to be the real key. Uh, while other countries have been very successful in copying what we're doing, in fact, sometimes illegally copying what we're doing, uh, America is the great innovator and the great inventor uh, of technology and, and food production. And I, I, I've told the president of this governor, I said, if, I believe if manufacturing had the same degree of basic research, applied research, and delivery system like extension, I don't think we'd be talking about the demise of American manufacturing. Yeah. The miracle of American agriculture yeah, has been phenomenal. 400% increase in production over the last 90 years with 10% less acres in that way. If that's not doing more with less, I don't know what it is, mm -hmm. but it needs all of us. And the kind of things that we do, the collaboration between University of Nebraska and this Ag Innovation Center here along with other partners, uh, for the noble cause of feeding the world, it's not a proprietary thing. It's not, uh, it's not the kind of thing we want to hoard, but share transparently and open source to really get it done quicker. 
Yeah, thank you. So innovation, and you can't talk Nebraska without talking about innovators yeah. uh, from Fred Astaire or, um, uh, gosh, Gabby Union to Standing Bear to Chief Red Cloud to Marie Sandoz to Willa Cather um, to Johnny Carson, heck, Larry the Cable Guy. Um, I'll jump over to you, um, Governor Ricketts. Uh, innovators, Nebraska, hand in hand, ag innovation. Uh, you talk a lot about, and I've listened, about growing Nebraska and this partnership. Can you speak a little bit about how ag innovation, how the ag economy is a part of growing Nebraska? Yeah, absolutely. You know, agriculture is the heart and soul of what we do here in Nebraska. It's our number one industry. One in four jobs are tied to agriculture. And so if we're going to grow our state, we have to grow our state's number one industry, which is agriculture. And that's what you see, and actually I wanted to hit upon one of the things the Secretary said about, because he mentioned the noble mission of feeding the world. You talked about uh, extension and how that had been so key for ag innovation. I think that when you're talking about alignment, that mission of feeding a growing world is part of what also <laughs> helps align everybody around driving that. Because, uh, you know, last night I was just at the State Fair and I was judging the Supreme Champion Beef. And one of the judges, who's from Idaho, was there talking about, just making some remarks, but he mentioned feeding the world. This is something that is pervasive through agriculture. It is a shared goal and mission by every producer mm -hmm. to feed the world. And I think that, you know, it is a noble mission. And it is, it's the person who was doing the judging at the State Fair from Idaho last night. It's the, the, the farmer that, you know, is in the central part of our state. Everybody you talk to, that's what they get. That's what they know the mission is about. I think that's what helps drive that alignment. And of course, if we're going to continue to be able to do that, we need people, as you mentioned about getting back to the innovation theme, we need people continuing to invest and making sure that we're finding ways to do it. That's where the university is key with regard to pioneering some of these technologies. But then, you know, if you, you want to talk about a huge innovation here in our state, center pivot irrigation. Yeah. Right? Frank I mean, Seibach, 1948. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that we are, we, 80 percent of the world's center pivots are manufactured here in Nebraska. And that is what has led us to be the biggest irrigated state in the country. We have more irrigated acres, over eight and a half million of them, than California. I mean, think about that. That, that is, again, how Nebraska drives innovation that then changes the world. So it, it is, I think, gets back to the, the work you talked about extension. Mm -hmm. I think it gets back to the alignment of how we think about feeding the world and how everybody is all rowing the oars in the same direction around accomplishing that. And then you see, again, the, the, the magic of the free enterprise system where people invest, look for those innovations. And again, this is how we again, continue to drive down how much water we're using to grow more corn. So I, I think, again, it just gets back to, we do have all the things aligned here in Nebraska and leverage the University of Nebraska, we leverage the free enterprise system, and that's what's driving all the innovation. Yeah, thank you, Governor. You know, you, you touch on so many things, uh, center pivot irrigation. While we started in that way, um, you go and visit any one of our amazing world-leading uh, center pivot manufacturers, and you'll find that they're also into smart infrastructure, whether that's connected with the railroad, whether that's about highways, whether it's autonomous vehicles. Uh, Secretary Purdue, you talked about, again, food for medicine. You can't talk about agriculture without thinking about the 21st century architecture of agriculture and innovation. It permeates everything that we do. We've talked about big data. We've talked about rural prosperity, rural communities. Those communities thrive by having access to amazing schools, uh, safe, affordable food, um, access to health care innovation, entrepreneurship, those are really these pillars that we're talking about. Governor Ricketts, would you share just a little bit about, from your vantage point as a uh, chief executive officer, the governor of this great state, as you work with the other components, the federal executive, legislative, um, state land grant system, for example, what does that look like? And then local governments as well. Yeah, I think it has to be a, a team effort. Um, you know, the federal government, obviously, with Congressman Fortenberry, you know, being on the Appropriations Committee, is deciding kind of the high-level priorities for the nation and carrying out that policy through how they fund, right? And, of course, USDA is, is a, a partner in making all that happen. But ultimately, it comes down to what's happening in each individual state, and that's where our system of federalism, I think, again, is just one of the strengths of our nation because, you know, what works in Nebraska may not work in New Jersey or Maryland, 
and vice versa. So we have to have the capability or the ability to be flexible with regard to how we take the big overall strategic position that's coming from the federal government and then apply it specifically in our states. And I think that's where, again, the University of Nebraska comes in because when we do the research here, where our state uh, you know, director of agriculture, Steve Wellman, works with our producers to be able to do it. And then we work with our local governments as well to be able to, to make sure we're all following on you know, what's right for Nebraska as far as implementing that policy. Great. Congressman Fortenberry, um, <laughs> recently at a markup, uh, you talked about a markup of the U.S. House Agricultural Appropriations Subcommittee meeting, and you spoke about the, your vision for the farm of the future. So we've already talked a little bit about the architecture of agriculture in the 21st century. Can you talk a little bit about how you see the future of agriculture growing here in Nebraska? Happy to. Um, May I take a step back for you a moment? You can, please. Because I'm sitting here reflecting on something. The Secretary and Governor mentioned the importance of agricultural extension. My grandfather was a county agent, and my mother was a 4-H extension agent, now called 4-H mm -hmm. extension educator. Uh, my father died when I was young, and I remember my grandfather looking at me and said, Jeffrey, what do you want to do in life? And I said, Papa, I want to be a farmer. Yeah. Well, life didn't exactly take that pathway, but look, look here I sit, engaged in this extraordinary discussion with the Secretary of Agriculture, the Governor of our state, with all of you innovators and educators who are, again, shepherding this great gift of our resources for, again, the well-being of society in its most elemental way, food. And so I just uh, feel a tremendous privilege in that regard. I think that's probably the underlying sentiment in which I was expressing uh, a projection of what the farm of the future looks like. Something else to add to this is the, a couple years ago, I think it was Chancellor Green and I were in this conversation. Agricultural programs are growing, student programs here. Mm -hmm. And of course, they're building upon the traditional fields of agronomy and plant science and animal science, but it also is environmental science. It's also international development, health and nutrition. We're talking about an alignment. That is the future of agriculture and what is creating a huge amount of exciting opportunities that are attracting ever-increasing numbers of young people because it is a holistic approach to the well-being of persons and the well-being of society. And so when you talk specifically about the farm itself, obviously production ag is our base, it's our tradition, and it's the building block of our well-being. Using the tools of innovation so that precision agriculture more precisely applies the inputs and produces greater outputs with less footprint, as you've talked about. Huge, huge opportunity. That comes about, though, through the advancement of technology. The Secretary and I are in complete alignment, and we just up the budget tremendously for something called rural broadband, high-speed internet. Now, that has big, big implications for precision agriculture, for telehealth, tele teleeducation, and telework. And the pandemic that swept upon us, of course, is really everything. everything. It is, uh, it's a tectonic plate shift that I think is going to advance this much further. So I think Congress and the administration are actually ahead of this to try to empower what that, in terms of the agriculture sector and rural development are going to look like uh, to enhance uh, economic well-being through a specific level of expenditure to get this technology out there. One final point. <coughs> yes. Um, we're talking a lot about the building blocks of traditional ag production, of course, and that's our source and mainstay but the agricultural family is expanding through niche opportunities, <clears throat> value adds. What we're interested in is connecting the farmer to the family and the urban to the rural and then creating local food economies. People wanna know where their food comes from. This is a growing market preference. And you're gonna see this in shape the future of agriculture as well when traditional row crop farmers potentially peel off a few acres and do something specialized. A young farmer who will never necessarily have a lot of land and be engaged in, in a high production may peel off some sort yep. of specialty project. You've got a food processing here that is value adding. All of that is combined into, again, yeah. the farm of the future. Oh, Congressman Fortenberry, as usual, there's a lot there to unpack and we don't have time today, but I think we've been saying uh, the farm of the future, we also mean the ranch of the future, the meat processing facility of the future, the feed yard innovation uh, of the future, and we're really talking beyond food, we're talking about food, fuel, feed, and fiber. And so uh, ag innovation playing a key role there. Um, Chancellor Green, uh, br bringing it home, you've talked about um, science and moving 
uh, science into practice. Can you talk a little bit about how UNL, big UNL, not just IANR, is positioned to bring practical, innovative solutions to ag innovation, but also really to the people of, of, of this great state here in Nebraska? Well, I, I might take just one step back, like, uh, like uh, the congressman did a minute ago, and I was sharing with the secretary earlier this morning when we were uh, doing a shared stewardship agreement between the state and the university and the Forest Service and the forest area. Many Nebraskans will recognize the name Charles Bessie. And Dr. Bessie was a professor here early in our history, came here in the early 1880s. We adopted him from Ohio and he came and stayed the rest of his life. Uh, Dr. Bessie was actually the architect of the Hatch Act that formed the ag research enterprise as we know it with the land grant system, went on to be the father of ecology and grassland ecology in particular, went on to be one of the founders of Science Magazine, the major you know, science publication in the world. So uh, we were kind of in the seat at the very beginning on this ag innovation thing, and it's been, our, it's been at a core of who we are ever since at the University of Nebraska. Um, I want to also point back to the secretary referenced the partnership between all of these different pieces of the puzzle. And you mentioned ARS and the Agricultural Research Service, uh, the in-house research arm of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, we, have, we house the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center here and have since the late 1960s that's the world leading center anywhere in the world to do with red meat production. Uh, as part of USDA, it's been a partnership with the university from the, for many years. I've got a personal place in my heart for it. I did my PhD there. I think everyone knows that. Uh, but it's a world-leading center that continues to make that innovation along with other uh, entities. I'm so pleased to see, and Congressman, thank you for your support in this, the desire to increase the funding for competitive research in USDA and the Ag Food Research Initiative. We continue to see that increase. I know that's in the plan for this year as well. It's so critical to what we're doing here and to continue to increase uh, that level of funding. And I'll just throw it out there. We're excited about the potential for, here on this campus, a new center for uh, the farm of the future that is under discussion, I know, within USDA that will do exactly the kind of things you're talking about. So just wanted to get those plugs in, Mike, before you we got, you before got him, the you got had the opportunity. <laughs> uh, but, but to your central question, absolutely, the university here is, has been a world leader in this arena. We are positioned to continue to be a world leader because of the importance of these areas to us in all of the ways that I mentioned earlier in my opening comments. Yeah. Um, First thing I would say is, you see, Secretary Purdue, if you if you take a shot at the Chancellor, he's gonna he's gonna take a shot back. So um, great to get those in there. You know, Ronnie, listening to you a little bit about partnerships, um, certainly the partnership that you mentioned with USDA ARS at U.S. Meat Animal Research Center, but we also have uh, a number of scientists on the East Campus, for example, that are ARS colleagues. Um, our partnership that you'll be ce celebrating here, uh, the three of you at the end, um, between the U.S. Forest Service and the Nebraska Forest Service, another great example of a partnership. Um, the U.S. Geological Survey's Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Units, yet another really neat partnership, not only between the, the USGS um, and the university, but through the Nebraska Game and Parks uh, uh, Division. Commission. And Mike, we should just mention, I, I can't let this go. I, I know in Nebraska we're watching it get a little drier here. There's a little mm, bit of concern right. about we're in a, perhaps the early I was part going of a, there next. part of a drought. First, luckily, the first one we've had yeah. in a while uh, here. But the, the a key partnership we have had and built at the university over the years is the National Drought Mitigation Center that is the world leader in this field. I uh, know USDA, Secretary mm -hmm. Purdue, relies on the NDMC for disaster assistance for that trigger point at which that happens. Uh, all of us remember 2012 here really well. Mm -hmm. The NDMC's drought monitor was on the news every night uh, nationally. Hopefully we won't be seeing that happen 
but uh, that's a, another prime example between USGS and NASA, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, yep. um, that, that helps bring that science to practice. Yep, and not just the science, Ronnie, but back to Governor Ricketts, your point, um, tying this back into the economics of things, the U.S. The, the National Drought Mitigation Center and the Drought Monitor also drive billions of dollars of federal relief to our producers that are in stress, stress situations. Well, we have five minutes, so uh, I promised some of the folks in the audience that we would open this up. Um, and so we'll take a, a break here and open this up for questions from those in the audience. If you would, there are microphone, there's a microphone here. I know that people can hear you because you all project but feel free to re remove your mask, state your name, your affiliation, and, and where you'd like your question directed. Okay, I know a lot of the people in the audience here, you're not shy. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Bain's gonna call on you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paul. <laughs> First question is always the toughest. And they are just locked into their social distancing mode, I guess. Yeah. Good morning, Mr. Secretary, and welcome to Nebraska. Thank you. I, uh, uh, on the Board of Regents, my name is Paul Kinney, and the question I would have would, uh, you know, 30 years ago we would not know anything like what MTBE was or ethanol for the most part, and, and we've transformed this uh, this product through the to the future, and and now what we're looking at in our business is how do we further break down the products that we produce? Where um, you know you instead of just ethanol, there's multitude of different types of alcohol we can produce. We can uh, we can break the sugars down before we f ferment them. Um, also, uh, 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 <clears throat> just the whole multitude of of process engineering where it makes everything else we do. Uh, more exciting, and and I wonder uh, how uh, how the administration stands on some of the development of the the new ethanol generation, uh, new types of things that we're producing. Thank you. Uh, again, Mike mentioned earlier, and we've talked a lot about food here, and food is that noble necessity. But uh, we know agriculture is also about fiber and fuel, and uh, and and as you mentioned, and. Uh, there's a lot of research going on in the, in the really the biochemistry of processing, uh, even from cellulosic uh, uh, stock uh, in that way as well. I think we'll crack that uh, nut at some point in the future and uh, provide a, uh, a whole new way of fueling uh, uh, America and the world. Uh, but uh, USDA is, again, aligned with uh, research, both public and private. I've had a lot of conversation with Jeff Broin, the CEO of, of uh, Poet, and, and their new technologies. They are innovating along and, uh, and, and moving forward in that way. And actually, you've seen recently some of the ethanol producers moving into other type products that you described as well. So this is part of that whole innovation agenda. And the great part about a capitalistic society uh, that uh, rewards innovation, creativity, risk-taking, entrepreneurship is that uh, there are rewards out there for those who uh, solve the puzzle. And uh, I think, again, the capital structure that we have in this country uh, will enable that. The ecosystem that we've developed from uh, our federal government and our appropriators down to uh, our, our university, uh, universities and our private uh, researchers, that's what, uh, that's what will solve the, the toughest issues that we have of feeding the world fueling the world in a safe, environmentally friendly way, you know, going forward. So we're happy for this research. I think they're, uh, they're just amazing things out there that we can't even dream about that I think are coming back, coming about as a result of what we're talking about here generally today. Right, and just jumping on that a little bit as well. <clears throat> um, I think one of the cool things that we need to be thinking about with ethanol is how do we make that into a feedstock for other types of chemicals? So obviously, <clears throat> we're using it um, you know, to, for fuel to power our cars. But if you look at a barrel of oil, a lot of the margin of that is not what you put into your gas tank. It's all the other derivatives that come out of that, distilling that barrel of oil into some other chemical. And to the extent that we can transform ethanol into that, to be able to do the same sort of thing, only having a renewable type way of doing it rather than a petroleum-based one, 
I think that's got tremendous potential. Obviously, we've got to be cost competitive to be able to make that work, but the more that we can make sure that we're thinking about innovative ways to be more cost effective with that, I think that opens up that possibility. And then, you know, you mentioned some of the other innovation, too, that ties back into sustainability is one of the cool things going on Cargill's campus up in Blair is uh, a company that is taking dextrose, sugar from corn, and then using that to feed algae to uh, create omega-3 fatty acids. That's right. Which then go into feeding salmon. Well, why is that important? Well, because the way you feed salmon today is you go out and catch other wild fish, you chop them up and you feed them to the salmon. But this would be a sustainable way of creating that really important omega-3 fatty acid for salmon's fish food that doesn't require you to go out and catch a bunch of fish and just chopping them up and feeding them to the salmon. You can do it in a way that, again, is sustainable and renewable. So that's the kind of cool, innovative things that are going on here in the state that I think really meet that dual purpose of feeding a growing world and then being sustainable and finding new ways to conserve the resources we have here. So I'm going to jump in. You could also feed them soybeans that are um, enriched in omega-3 fatty acids to get that nice pink color that we all love in our salmon. I want to uh, take this opportunity to say thank you to each of you. Thanks for uh, being innovators. Thanks for your leadership. At the end of the day, what I'm hearing is that this is really about producing food, fuel, feed, and fiber for a growing world, doing it in a way that takes care of our water, our land, our natural resources, our soil, in a resilient manner, and taking care of the people and the communities and the families that produce that food, fuel, feed, and fiber. We are at our witching hour, Chancellor hey, Mike, Green. Can I just, <laughs> yeah. I, know you're, I know you're wanting to- Trying to wrap up. I wanted to get one last comment in here and thank the Secretary for this, because I know he's been very, very active and has led in this way. All of this innovation that we are developing for agriculture relies on our ability for being science literate That's right. and for being able to apply and use technology. Well, I know you've been such a leader in that way and appreciate that, and I just wanted to publicly thank you. For here, that. here, science literacy, ag literacy, water literacy, so critical in moving ag innovation forward. With that, would you join me in thanking our panel?